Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the AFR EMS Case Studies. My name is Chris Ortiz. I'm the EMS Division Chief for Albuquerque Fire Rescue. And today we're joined by our Medical Director, Dr. Kim Pruitt. Hi, Chief. And we're also joined by the one, the only, Lieutenant Jacob Tapia. Part of the best class ever. Oh, hands down, the 69th. We've been we've been plugging that one. We keep saying that the 76ers are trying to one-up us, but 69th is where it's at. So appreciate you coming out to talk to us. Um, so obviously you're part of our records division, but um, you do work a fair share in the field. Um, and you take all the busy spots, all the busy stations. So this was an event when you were uh, assigned with uh, Medic 12, Engine 5, and you all were dispatched out to attend Delta for chest pain. Um, and I think one of the things we want to highlight in this discussion is that this was a difficult assessment, and it was really hard to pinpoint specifically what was happening with the patient at the moment. Um, so you guys got all of the information that you could, but really – um, the juice in this case really came from the findings once we got him to the hospital. So um, I'll set the stage with that, but it sounds like you were dispatched the 59-year-old male, and he was complaining initially of chest pain, but tell us what you saw when you actually got there. Uh, we climb up three flights of stairs. There's only, there's like people standing outside, and they're all pointing. It's up there. Um, but when we get inside... There's one other individual, his neighbor, I guess, they didn't have very much information. And then the gentleman's on his bed, kind of like rocking back and forth and um, asking for help. I can't really remember exactly what he was saying, but uh, if you've ever seen somebody writhing in pain, that's the, my wife had pancreatitis. And so when you see somebody in super amounts of pain, they can't sit still. And that's kind of how this gentleman was presenting. I, I just left him with the, the pipe man trying to get other um, information from the, the neighbor. He can only really give me his name. The gentleman isn't responding to my questions. How long has it been going on? He just keeps on reflecting on the pain and that his legs aren't working. And did he reveal any history, like past medical history, that helped guide your thought process, or it was pretty vague? So... Um, I had never heard the fact that your legs won't work if you're having a, a AAA or an aortic aneurysm. I go back and then as we're loading him up by that time onto a mega mover to get him down the three flights of stairs. And uh, I don't know if I asked him while we were going down or at some point I asked him if he had high blood pressure and he, he said yes. So... Yeah, it's difficult. So right now we have a patient who's just full body pain, um, kind of everything hurts, kind of writhing around, doesn't allow for a good assessment, um, is able to tell you that one leg feels like he can't move it at all, and that's really all you got at this point. So you guys get him into the back of the ambulance. Sounds like um, Albuquerque Ambulance was comfortable with his presentation at that point, said so they would just execute the transport. You guys didn't ride in. Is that correct? Yeah, so once we got him, uh, we started to do a little bit more of the assessing down there. We tried getting another pressure um, getting a heart rate again and he kept on mentioning my legs don't work and so he goes can you move them and I tried like pushing them together they didn't feel they didn't feel like a lack of muscle tone but they didn't he wasn't able to move them at all I did yeah and I'm I'm like well I don't know what's going on with you bro but then he started to mention um that he he goes I I think I'm gonna die I'm gonna die and so the five five medic again, she was like, I think the classic sign is paralysis in both legs. And so she goes, I think it's a triple A. And then I asked her if she needed a writer and she denied. Interesting. Okay. So then we fast forward to his arrival at the E D. Um, and we have some follow-up as to what we found when we got to the ED. We'll talk to yeah. us about that, Doc. And you guys have done a great job getting a history, and especially that meth and cocaine history is important here because those um, sympathomimetic drugs can increase your blood pressure significantly, and if you have underlying hypertension, it's usually typically a male in a 60s, 65, 70 kind of range where this may happen. But um, what they found when he got there, because he was complaining of leg pain, is that his left leg was actually cool to the touch and didn't have a pulse. And so anytime you've got an otherwise able-bodied individual that's um, complaining of leg pain to the point that they can't walk, there's always like three things. Is it is it orthopedic? Is it bony trauma? Is it neurological? So is there something wrong in his spinal cord or with the nerves? And then the other question is, could it be vascular? And in this case, there was clearly a vascular problem because it was cool, and he had the, those six Ps, the, the pain, the pallor, the paresthesias, and the other three that I can't remember off the top of my head right now. Um, 
but uh, ultimately with his, his chest pain, his history, it led them to obtaining a CT scan. Oh, and in the ER they had um, obtained blood pressures on both arms, and they found a very significant um, difference. By this time he was more cooperative with them than it sounds like he was for you. Maybe his pain was better controlled. Um, but they found that in his left arm he had 100 systolic blood pressure, and in his right arm was 160. And so anytime you have a pulse differential like that with vascular findings in the legs, there's a high degree of suspicion for a aortic dissection. And that's where um, blood, basically the aorta, if you remember your arteries, there's three levels of um, uh, like muscular lining to them, and one of the linings has ripped but it hasn't quite perforated to the outer lining yet. And so the blood under high pressure will track into essentially a false lumen. And depending how big that hole is, the blood that's coming out of the heart can go into that false lumen and basically dissect. In this gentleman, it had dissected all the way from his heart well into his um, femoral and iliac arteries, but it cuts off everything in between. So it cut off blood flow to the kidneys, to his bowel, and also to his legs. Um, So he was in profound distress um, when he got there. And luckily, because of your quick movement and assessment, he had uh, got to surgery pretty quickly. And we always hear from the paramedic school days and our assessments is like that severe ripping and tearing that people will kind of describe. What is that or what are they feeling and how do we address that if somebody has that sense of impending doom and they feel like there's a ripping or tearing inside their body? So those that is a classic textbook finding. Of all of the dissections that I've seen, they, they're they typically not great at describing that ripping or tearing pain. And like this man, he had pain in his legs, but the problem was up here. Um, he did actually mention that he had, like chest. I asked him. Uh, what type of pain is it, or can you describe it? And he said kind of tearing. Tearing, yeah. yeah. So I kind of was leading down that. Um, my biggest thing is I had never heard of the paralysis, so that was that was big. My general algorithm for when I when this comes to the top of my thought process is anytime there's chest pain plus neuro. So in this case, case, it's chest pain plus neuro, like his legs aren't working. Frequently, it's chest pain plus neuro, like in the hands. Either my hand is weak or I can't see um, or I can't feel my fingers or there's numbness in my arm, arm or my leg. Anytime you have chest pain plus neuro, I always wonder if it could be a dissection. And then... Um, Really, the quickest way to check for that is to check for pulses at the both the radial arteries in the left and the right and see if there's a difference there. And then you, if the patient will allow you to, you can move on to a blood pressure. Um, but chest pain plus neuro, I always also really tend to respect and get a little bit nervous when there is that fear of impending doom, especially in a situation where it seems pretty grave because usually they're right. And uh, that makes me move a little bit faster. Even if I can't figure out what's going on, it makes me accelerate my assessment um, because they they tend to know if it's if it's truly that sense of impending doom, not just like anxiety. But same thing when they're thirsty and they're shocky. Uh, it's a it's a sign of you need to accelerate your process here. Yeah. Always difficult. So early identification, if you can, through your assessment with some of those um pieces of information that you gave us, but ultimately the definitive care for them is going to be surgery. Right? Surgery. Mm-hmm. And uh, they can put, if you look at the, the graphic, I think that we have available, basically the ripping or tearing, this one happened um, outside of the pericardial sac, so it dissected down. Sometimes dissections can happen into the pericardial sac and cause more of a tamponade type picture. Um, but they just put a stent in there, basically block the hole and then uh, reperfuse the aorta where the blood should go and um, can fix it. And this man luckily uh, did make it to surgery and was able to survive um, survive this event. It was pretty severe. And maybe it's me and with the, the learning that I had, um, maybe not paying attention, but is all of this dissection happening the time that it initiates or is it a buildup over time? I always think of an aneurysm of the out pouching and it's the constant pressure but then it kind of bulges and then you start to have the pain that's a great question so there's two types of catastrophic aortic injuries the aneurysm is something that's like a silent killer and it builds up over time and it is exactly that it's like out pouching or ballooning of the aorta and when those rupture they just 
explode like a balloon. And usually those patients um, don't really have a chance at survival um, because they bleed so fast. Um, whereas a dissection, luckily, it's still contained within that aorta. And so there's still some blood flow that's getting where it needs to go. Just some of it is ripping or tearing. So the dissection pain tends to be a sudden onset of severe ripping or tearing chest pain plus those neuro symptoms. So this is like a just out of the blue. And whereas like a heart attack kind of chest pain can be um, like related to exertion, like mowing the lawn or climbing the stairs or whatever, this doesn't necessarily have to be. It can just happen at any minute. Great job. Um, early identification, I think quick transport, and then the Albuquerque Ambulance Medic kind of speaking up and saying that some of these findings are lining with it. So it kind of probably changed their thought process during transport. But now, obviously, this is you've been doing this for a really long time, and this was the first time you had encountered this case. Any takeaways you have for from this case that you'll use moving forward in terms of the assessment, especially these difficult patients that aren't really cooperating um, with your assessment? Yeah, I think, uh, um, well, first of all, I appreciate the opportunity to come over here because uh, I'm getting ready to celebrate our 20th year and uh, never seeing this before. So it's a good learning process for anybody coming out uh, or seeing the video in the future. So um, a lot of times as paramedics, we're, we're taught to step back and then just let the crews take the vital signs. So um, one of the big takeaways that I would say is to get your crews comfortable with those signs and symptoms. And if you hear that their legs aren't working, well, then go ahead and check double pulses see if there's differentiating um, pressures or um, amounts on each side and then uh, try and go from there because we couldn't get a, a good blood pressure on scene. And so, uh, yeah, just making sure that the crews are comfortable with that assessment so then they can bring it back to you and then asking those questions. Do you have high blood pressure, sir? And then they can they can relay it so mm -hmm. that's a great takeaway i think for us especially like we've been doing this for a long time and you kind of just get lulled into that sense of like ah oh, this might be this or this is just a bs call but then when you really start to probe and look a little bit further like there are complaints that just you know are really acute um that you have to you have to take seriously and treat and assess you guys did a really good job of doing that not just blowing it off as a oh it's just just pain or just due to, you know, drug use or anything like that. So you guys did fantastic. Well, and I like, there's some things that are textbook. There's a lot that's not. A lot of medicine is in that gray area. And this is like, oh, my legs aren't working and I'm, I'm feeling that tearing pain. And you're all, uh, that's just like the book says. So mm -hmm. yeah. absolutely. All right. Well, thank you for taking the time to come out and talk with us about it. Um, it's a great case. A uh, lot, lot of learning points from it. Um, if you have any interesting cases you want to talk about, uh, feel free. Reach out to the QA cadre. You can use our SharePoint tab um, to uh, submit a case study and come out and talk about it because it's the best way. Like we talked about 20 years of doing that. We'd never encountered it. So uh, we want to get those types of calls to discuss. But until then, we'll see you next time. Thank you, everybody.